Good morning. Have you ever thought about that question, like, what does it mean to be a Christian? Um, I think if we were to ask that question, even probably even here today or um, just pretty much anywhere, there's probably a couple things that will come to your mind. Um, maybe that means going to a specific church, or maybe that looks like, yes, I believe in Jesus. You know, I believe that he was a real person, or that I believe that he was, they lived on this earth, or lots of people have different understandings of what it means to be a Christian. Um, and I think, honestly, um, it's kind of, a, kind of a question where we, don't, we haven't really thought through it. If you, if you haven't really spent the time to think through what does it really mean to be a Christian, what does that word mean? You know, in the first century, after Jesus, um, several of the Roman emperors, when, they, when Christianity started growing, they saw them as a threat to, to Rome, um, and they wanted to kind of expel all the Christians. We even see that one of the writers of most of the New Testament books, the Apostle Paul, um, tried his best to kill Christians. That was his profession before he became a follower of Christ and before he started planting churches and, and making disciples, is that he would kill Christians. We see even the stoning of Stephen. Um, and, and so that this idea of following Christ, when you said, I am a follower of Christ, that phrase carried weight. And that weight could mean your very death and your very life. And I think sometimes today we take that idea of following Christ and it's become light. When I say I'm a follower of Christ, it may mean that I just like to have like cross jewelry. But if you even think about the cross in itself, cross, the necklace or an earring or something that you wear, um, what does that mean? See, for Jesus, that meant his very death. Right? And when he said, carry your cross, when Rome would, would crucify people, they'd kill people, they'd kill traitors or public, um, you know, people who, criminals who committed crimes against Rome, they'd put you up on a cross, they would nail you to it, you'd be naked, and you'd be stuck up there dying until you slowly, usually asphyxiated or maybe you bled out, but you would be dead. Um, and then they would leave, let your body hang up there on the cross so that anybody who walks by would see you on that cross and be like, I'm not going to mess with Rome. It was a heavy, heavy thing. And, I, and we're starting this series called Counting the Cost, and before we jump back into 1 Peter. Um, and, and that's kind of the idea what we want to kind of get at, is what the Bible looks at when it means to be a follower of Christ. What does it mean to be a Christ follower, a uh, believe, believer in Jesus? And what does that mean for us as a, a follower of Him? And now even as a church, we've been praying kind of like for kind of our, our as a body, like where are we going, where are we headed, and I think in the next fall, in the winter time, we want, really want to kind of work through this idea of discipleship, of being followers of Christ, and we want to be a body, a, a church body that helps walk alongside each other as we help each other understand what it means to follow Jesus. Um, and so as we kind of try, are trying to kind of work through that, we, we need to have a good understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so today we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles, turn there to Luke chapter 9. Um, you may have gotten a couple things this morning. Um, one is uh, this card here. This is just kind of like an introductory kind of little flyer that we've been passing out. Um, maybe even came today because you got one of these. Um, if you would like to hand some of these out to your friends, coworkers, family members, we'd encourage you to invite them. If there you know, questions about Christianity, this is a really good series for them to kind of come and, and find out more of what it means to be a follower of Christ. So feel free to grab some of those on the table on the way out. And then also, we're going to be doing something. Um, we're trying out this series, but you also have a little card right here. And it says, uh, for whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And this is in uh, Luke 9, 24. And so I'm just going to challenge you guys to memorize this verse as a church. So as we, as we think about this, this uh, series, memorize this verse. Put it next to your you know, your bed, or put it on the refrigerator, or put it, you know, next to your office, or where you go to work, and next to your computer, and just be at a place where it's very visible, and just to pound it into your head of memorizing, memorize, memorize, because there's so many times, as, even as I'm throughout the day, and a verse of scripture will come to my mind, and it'll be key of, of what I'm going through at that moment, and it was just going through scripture, memorizing scripture, and letting scripture drive into our hearts. 
Um, and so this series is going to be a little bit different than we normally do. Normally we go through a book of the Bible at a time. We'll continue to do that as a church as a majority of the time. In fact, we're going to 1 Peter and 2 Peter um, following this series. Um, but this series is going to be kind of like hitting kind of what the Bible talks about in big passages of, of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so when we look down at Luke chapter 9, this is kind of our key passage in verse 23. And it says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and and of the holy angels." And this is kind of a special passage for me particularly. When I was in high school, um, we had there's a group of guys, and we had this kind of like big youth event, and, and uh, they, they preached a message on, on this passage. And I remember as I was sitting there as a high schooler, or a junior in high school, and I remember hearing this passage preached, and, and every single one of these guys got up and kind of shared testimony and uh, testimonies of what this passage meant to them. And, and what it came down to is that if Jesus is everything, if Jesus is everything, then, then I am nothing. Then I am nothing. And, and that, that sounds really kind of out there. It still sound, sounds kind of very bold to say that, but, and I'll explain what that means in a little bit. But this idea that Jesus is everything, Everything in my life that I was living for and building up towards was all about myself, right? I was thinking about, all right, going into college, and okay, I'm going to get a good job and a good degree, and I'm going to get paid a lot of money, and I've got these plans for my life, and it was all centered around me and what would make me happy and what would make me, you know, joyful or whatever, and it was all centered around those questions. Those were the questions I was asking, and as this message was being preached, I realized that If anyone wants to come after Jesus, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. And as I'm hearing this message preached and I'm thinking about my own life and following after Jesus, I realized that at that point, I wanted to follow Jesus and no one else. That Jesus was going to be the course and direction of my life from then on out. And as God was speaking to me through that passage being preached, I realized that that was where my heart was. See, a follower of Christ starts there that I want to follow Jesus and nothing else, no one else, not myself, not my ideas, not my dreams, not whatever I want to do or what someone else wants me to do or this person wants me to do or that person wants me to do. It's all about Jesus. It has to be. It has to be. You think even just from creation, that the God that has created everything, right, that he spoke it into existence from nothing, and then he created us, and he made us. And we, it talks about in, in Genesis 1 through 3 that how God created man and woman. And all of this was to glorify him. And speaking of his might and magnificence, in Romans chapter 1, we see that God has basically laid his fingerprints over the entire world so that not all of us are without excuse. When we look at all that's around, we can't help but see that everything is about God and all glorifies him. It's all his. And it makes sense even from that creation standpoint, and it makes sense when it comes to being a follower of Jesus. I've heard it said before, and I can't remember who the guy was originally who said this, but he said, you know, if, if going to church makes you a Christian, then going to a garage makes you an automobile. And I was like, man, that's good, because I think sometimes we view Christianity here. I came, I left, I did my due for the week, I'm a Christian. But a follower of Jesus is so much more than that. Look in the main text for today in Luke chapter 14. And we're going to come back here in Luke chapter 9. But I'm looking at Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. It says in verse 25, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, 
will not sit down first and deliberate, deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 <clears> to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, if any one of you, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. I like how this passage starts out. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them. This is right at the moment where you're like, oh yeah, great crowds are following you, Jesus. Here's the, the moment, right? Here's the moment you're to talk to them and share with them. And every time in, in, the, in the Gospels when you see Jesus and great crowds start coming around him, he says really hard things. It's never like just a really easy message like, oh yeah, by the way, for following me, I'm going to make your life so awesome. Like, you're going to have all your heart has desired, all the riches, all the wealth, all the prosperity, and I'm going to make it happen for you. No, he, he doesn't say that. He says the opposite. Great crowds start following Jesus, and he starts telling them, the, the hardest things they could hear. Here, he says, If anyone comes after me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And you're, this is kind of like, whoa, what in the world are you saying, Jesus? Are you saying that we're supposed to now hate our family and hate ourself and, and be like this kind of really just mean person all the time and going around and just hating everybody? And what Jesus was trying to get at when he was speaking to the crowds is the core issue for most of us. Because it's really easy for us to say, yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus. Right? It's easy to say that. But what do you do when everything else is on the line? The things you hold most dear are on the line. Here, he's talking about family. I mean, I'd probably be, you know, not far of a stretch to say, like, who the most important people in your life are. They're they're probably going to be family members. I mean, now, again, as a dad, as a father, having kids, I mean, I, you know, could imagine what happened if something happened to my kids. Being a husband, my wife, could imagine what happened to, to those that I love the most, my wife and my kids, even my mom and my dad, my brother, you know, all these family members, and, and the list goes on, right? Those, those people are very important to me. And I'm sure in your life, if I were to ask you who those people were, you could identify them immediately, those people who are the most important to you. And what Jesus is saying here is that we have, he's trying to help elevate our priorities, right? Because we all have people, we all have things, we all have things in our life that we value. And we place value on those things. And if you're not sure if you place value on those things, here's a simple question. Where do you spend most of your time? Who do you spend most of your time with? What do you spend most of your time thinking about? What do you spend most of your money on? And that's probably the things and people that you value the most. And that's not bad, by the way, to, to place value in that we have on people. We, we do that by nature. But what Jesus is getting at is that we have to properly put that in its order. Because if Jesus is everything, everything else is nothing compared to that kind of devotion. So what does this look like? Well, I mean, early on in the early church, going back to this, people would come to follow Jesus. And they would say, yes, I'm a follower of Christ. And their family may not believe that this Jesus guy is really him, really the Messiah. And they'd say, no, you can't follow Jesus. You don't follow him. You need to go back and, and renounce all this Christianity stuff. And you need to do what, what we've taught you and what we've trained you and what we've led you to believe. And Jesus is saying here, these kinds of things are going to happen. Your family is going to say, no, we don't, don't follow this. Don't believe this. You can't do that. Jesus is more important. Now, again, we realize in Scripture what he's not saying here is that we literally display hate towards our family, our wife, our father, brother, sister, husbands, whatever. Because we understand as we preach through Ephesians chapter 5 and understand the role of marriage and that marriage and kids and all these other relationships take shape in the context of this relationship with Christ. As I follow Jesus, that my, my relationship with my wife will, will work its way out in the way that I follow Jesus and the way that should carry its way out. The way that I follow Jesus should be the way that I understand how I should love my mom and dad and care for my mom and dad and, and my kids and how I love my kids. But we have to put them in their proper context. I think these are difficult things that sometimes cause people to leave. And if it came down to it, and your family says, 
Do you believe Jesus or are you going to follow what I'm telling you to do? And if you knew that that relationship, not, not by your doing, but by their doing, would be severed, would you still follow Christ? It's a hard question. It's a really hard question. Let's go back to that Luke chapter 9 passage. Luke chapter 9 and then verses 23 through 26. In this verse, in verse 23, it says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. First thing we'll look at there was mean to deny yourself. I mean, the, the, the first aspect of being a follower of Christ is that it's not about you. You have to understand that. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's only about Jesus. The second thing he says is taking up your cross. Again, this, this verse here may not mean that you were going to literally die, you know, for Christ, but if if it came down to it and someone's putting a gun to your head and said, do you believe in Jesus or are you going to get a bullet? And you said, I believe in Christ. Boom. What would you do? It's taking up your cross. That it's a, it's a daily remembering the gospel. That it's not about me and it's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus and the work he did on the cross. Going back to the cross and what that looks like and what that means. If you're, if you're not a Christian or if you're kind of exploring or you're kind of checking this out or maybe you are a Christian and maybe you've kind of just been confused about this, every single person on this planet, no matter who we are, we have all sinned against a holy and righteous and just God. You know, if you look at the Ten Commandments, thou shalt know other gods before me and over the graven images. Have you put God first 100% of all your time, all your energy, all your devotion? I haven't. And, and you haven't either. Have you ever lied? Um, yes, we've lied, right? If you ever committed adultery, well, Jesus says if you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Again, we're all guilty. Have you ever committed murder? Jesus says if you have hate in your heart, you've committed murder. All of a sudden, when you look at the Ten Commandments, and, and the, 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 this is in the gospel, and we see that Jesus, he's explaining the commandments that all of us are guilty. And because of that breaking the law, we deserve punishment. We deserve death. Instead of receiving death, Jesus Christ goes to the cross. And instead of, you know, he's the king of the universe, he's fully fully God, and he's taken on flesh, and now fully man, and he has gone to the cross naked and crucified and being tortured and killed, and he's suffering the wrath of God on his shoulders all throughout. Why would he do that? Genesis 1, we we see the creation of all things, that that God created everything. In in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was, created the world, right? He created the universe. And here he is, God of all heaven, who's taken on human flesh and is suffering and dying for you and for me. And he does that out of his love for us. And he offers that as a gift, Forgiveness, righteousness as a gift to those who believe in him, who have for, been, who've repented of, of their sin and understand who Jesus is and have turned to follow him. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And when you realize the weight of your sin and that there is absolutely no hope and that you're like, God, I don't care if anything else in my life happens or anything else happens the way I want it to. I want to follow you. Jesus, I want to follow you. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so in this idea of the gospel, that it's all Jesus' work, right? It's 100% Jesus' work. The reason why we're forgiven, following after Christ doesn't make us more forgiven, but it's the proper response because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. It's the only response, taking up your cross and following Jesus. In 24, he says, if you try to save your life, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Isn't it interesting like, how many times do you try to hold on to things? If you think about, I'm not just being completely transparent with you, I'm a control freak. I like to know that my world is ordered and that everything that I do has a reaction. And if I try to, like, make a cause, I know what reaction is going to come from that. And I like that. You know, it makes me feel good at night, right? If I do this, then this is going to happen. If I do this, this is going to happen. But then you think about the things that happens in life. What do you do with cancer? What do you do with health issues? What do you do with kids who, who have all kinds of issues going on that you weren't expecting or weren't ready to deal with? And, and honestly, the cause and the effect don't quite match up. And you're like, I, I'm trying to do everything right, and this effect just doesn't keep working out right. 
the things we try to save and we try to hold on and we try to, we try to like gather our world together where it makes sense, it's an illusion. Right? Nobody can really do that. No matter how hard you try to make your world make sense and to hold on to it, it eventually will spiral out of control. Loss of job, cancer, again, there are so many things you could throw in that list. Loss of a family member. Um, and, and if you're not careful, everything just goes just out of, out of loop and out of control, and it's crazy. And, and Jesus wants us to know that, that we are not in control. As much as we like to think that we are in control, we're not. And whoever tries to save his life, you could pretend like, you know, well, you know what? I want to do this my way. Christianity sometimes is like, uh, we are talking in the foyer earlier about this idea that Christianity sometimes has this buffet mentality. You've been to like a buffet before, you know, you've had like, it's all these options, the Golden Corral, you know, they have this chocolate fountain there sometimes, and it's really awesome until the kids stick their fingers in there, and then you're eating that and getting sick, and it's really gross. But all these options are really cool, right? You've got like nacho. I remember as a kid, we would, it was Ryan's, and we'd go there after church on Sundays, and they'd have like, you can get like fried chicken fingers, and then I'd get like nachos and cheese, and I would have nothing healthy on my plate at all. Like all, anything green was not on my plate. Right, it was all fried, and it was all delicious. And then my ice cream, I put, like, tons of gummy bears inside it and sprinkles, and I just loaded that thing up. We love buffets. But coming to Christianity is not the same way. It's not, well, I like this, and I like this, and I'm going to try to put some of this together and this together and this together, and I'm going to make it my own thing because I really disagree with this, but I really like that. I like the love part. I don't like the wrath part. I like this. I don't like that. I like the, you know, the part about Jesus you know, dying for us, but I don't like the part that we're sinners. Can't do that. It's not one or the other. It's all or nothing. Because when you start changing it and making it a buffet and you start saying, this is what I want it to be, it becomes something else entirely and not Christianity. And you can't follow Christ if you're following something that you've invented in your head. Me and Daniel were talking this week, and I think about, you know, just in, in marriage, right? I know my wife better than anybody else. I know when she's upset. I know when she's happy. I know when she's sad. I can tell when she walks in the door because I've spent time to know her. Somebody else can claim they know Lindsay, and may have never met her. And they may say, no, Lindsay does this, and Lindsay does this, and Lindsay does this, and Lindsay does this. And I'm like, you haven't even met her. You don't even know. But I know her. And God wants us to know him that way, where we know God inside and out, where we know who he is. We know what he loves. We know what he hates. We know what he values. And when we try to put this buffet mentality together of trying to think, I'm going to build my relationship with Christ this way or this way or this way. We're trying to basically create our own, save our own world, and we're going to lose it all. We're going to lose it all. Whoever tries to save their life will lose it, or loses his life for my sake will save it. Christianity says the opposite of that. It says, Jesus, I know this is the, the, probably the craziest thing I've ever heard of or ever thought of in my life, but I realize that this is what you are and this is who you are and this is what you stand for and, and I want to follow you even though this is difficult. You know, we believe some really difficult things. One about biblical sexuality. I mean, you think about in culture today, it's a huge thing. It's a huge issue going on. The exclusivity of Christ. That Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. What sin is and defining that and saying that that's a real thing, and we're sinners, and I'm a sinner, and you're a sinner. And we've sinned against the holy and righteous and just God. They're not easy concepts, to be honest. The concept of hell, being a place of torment, where people go who don't have followed Christ because, they, because our sin has already condemned us. Those are not easy things, and I, I realize that. But yet, I believe them to be true. Because God's word says it, and even though it may be hard for me to wrestle with, and maybe you're sitting there thinking, like, these are hard concepts for me. I'm hard, it's hard for me to kind of fight through that and, and to think through those things. And, and it's really difficult. I understand that. But will it do you any good to try to change those things, to whitewash them, to make them look like they're not there in order to make Jesus more palatable for you? If it's not Jesus, you're not following him. You're following your own man-made religion, and you're trying to save your own life, and in doing so, you're going to lose you're going to lose because one day, I believe every single one of us will die and we'll face judgment. And we'll go up to God and it would really be this. 
You know, be, it'll either be you, your name is written in the book because you believed in Christ and you've accepted his righteousness, it's all Jesus, or you haven't. And that's it. That's the only thing that matters. And if you haven't done that, God's not going to say, hey, well, what did you do? How many good things did you do? Did your good deeds outweigh your bad? He's going to look to see if your name's written in the book, and if it's not written in the book, you're not going in. It's that simple. Because it's all about Jesus and nothing to do with you and with me. It's all about Jesus. He ends that section by saying in 20. In 20, or 25, he says, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? What does it matter if you're the richest person on the planet with $18 billion in your net worth and you have all these houses and you have the life that you really wanted and you die and spend an eternity in hell? What does it matter? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what you do with Jesus Christ. 26, he says, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. That Jesus is coming back, and this is a fact. And he will come back, and he will take with him those who have been regenerated and saved, born again, who their name is written in the book of life, and those who are not will spend eternity in hell without him. Again, this is something we believe because it's in the Bible. And we believe it to be true. Following Jesus is not easy. Going back to Luke chapter 14 here. He says in uh, verse 26, verse 27, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Bearing your own cross, realizing it's not about you, dying to yourself, letting him be crucified, and just accepting the life and forgiveness of Christ. Verse 28, he starts talking about this idea of counting. What does it mean to count the cost? And kind of even where we got kind of this idea of counting the cost from our sermon series title. Verse 28, it says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. It's an analogy of building a tower or a house or building some kind of thing. And you think as you build... I mean, I don't know, maybe you guys have done home improvement projects. He's, he, this is a common thing, a common metaphor you would say in these days of you're building something. You'd have to make sure you had enough for the materials. Or if you don't have enough for the materials, you're going to build like halfway, and it's going to be this like incomplete tower, incomplete house. And, you know, it's going to be able to, people are going to be like driving, walking by or whatever, riding your donkey by and seeing your house and being like, man, this guy didn't finish it. He didn't really think through that too well, did he? He didn't plan out that house plan. That construction really didn't kind of work out for him, and it's going to be kind of like this mocking thing. And he uses this analogy to help us understand what does it mean to follow Christ. That, and this is not, a, again, a, a works-based thing where if, if you do this, if you do so many things, then you will have built your tower. It all goes back to value, right? It's a value-based thing. And when Jesus talks about discipleship in the New Testament, he helps us understand that it's about value. What do you value? All right, what's important to you? Um, I want to again go over to Luke chapter 18 and see the story of this guy called, is the rich man. In verse 18, chapter 18, verse 18, it says, and a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Again, he's hitting the Ten Commandments, ones we, we all know. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad. For he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, 
There is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children or for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, come, and the age to come eternal life. This really rich man comes to Jesus, and he's got everything. He comes to Jesus, and he asks him, he says, Jesus, he calls him good teacher. Um, again, as a, and again, if you're a follower in these days, a disciple, you would oftentimes, if you're just a, a Jew in that day, you would follow different rabbis. And, and it was a choice for you. You would go around to different rabbis and say, I want to follow this guy, or I want to follow this rabbi, or I want to follow this rabbi. And, and you would go follow them around, and you would learn from them. Here, Jesus went to his disciples, and he went to disciples, and he calls them out, and he says, come follow me, come follow me. Peter, James, and John are out fishing, right? They're, they're doing their job. <laughs> they're called, they're supposed to do. It's their living, their income. It's also their father, you know? They're, they're, it's a family kind of business. And they just like, okay, drop their nets and go follow after Jesus. They leave their job, they leave their family behind, they go follow Jesus, here, Jesus is talking to this rich man who comes up to Jesus, and he wants to follow Jesus and says, I want to follow you, rabbi, good teacher, let me follow you. And Jesus tells him, and he says, all right, well, first of all, why do you call me good? And I think there's the, kind of the, the first kind of crux of we're getting a hint of what's going on here. Because Jesus all the time, you don't see this maybe on the surface, but he knows what's going on inside the person's heart who's coming to him. So all these people come to Jesus, and Jesus, if you, if you just read the Gospels, he always gets right to the heart of the issue, right to the heart. He doesn't, he doesn't beat around the bush. He just kind of gets right to it. And he says, why do you call me good? And uh, he says, no one good, is good except God alone. So Jesus is also making a, a, a statement about himself. No one's good except God. If you're calling me good. What are you saying? You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all of these I have kept for my youth. What do we know from what we've just said about the commandments? That all of us are guilty. So what we this know is that this man is already deluded about thinking of his own goodness. He basically thinks he is good. Jesus is trying to say no one's good except God. And you're trying to say that you've kept all the commandments. He says, okay. Jesus gets right to the heart. Sell everything you got. Man's like, What? Sell everything? Uh, I don't know. What do we know about the first and second commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt know graven images. This man has his own God right there, and Jesus has just identified it. It's his money. It's his wealth. It's his possessions. And Jesus called it out and called it to the carpet, right so he could hear and right so he can understand. This man's God that he worshipped and what he served was his money. Yes, he probably was a good Jew. He probably did most of the things that he was required of him. But his God was not the God of heaven. It wasn't Yahweh. It was his money, his possessions. And I think that as we think of our own selves and our own lives, what is your God? What is your idol? What is the thing that you really worship? Because we've all been created to worship. If you're unconvinced of that, you should go down to the South on Saturdays and college football games because, I mean, like, we spend tons of money on football games, and, I, and, I, I'm, and again, I'm being fully transparent. I love college football. I love it. I love watching it. I love the Gamecocks when they play, and I hate it when they lose, which happens more often than, I, than when they win, it seems like sometimes. And, and, it, and it's one of those deals where if you're, if you're you could see it, and, like, people spend lots of money on, on going to games and and, and paraphernalia, and all these things, and they're worshiping. They're worshiping. They have made their God what happens on Saturdays, on football games. It's their idol. It's what they worship. You know, if you're unconvinced of that, see what happens when your team loses. What are, you, are you like, oh man, I remember like in college when, when the Gamecocks would lose, and I'd be like, I'd be depressed. I'd literally be depressed. I'd be sitting there like, I don't want to do anything today. We just lost. I just want to take a nap. I'm going to eat a bowl of ice cream. Like, it was, it was sad. I was sad. My, my day and my weekend was changed because of the result of what some college guys did on playing a game, right? It was my idol. And I think for all of us, if I were to ask you again, what do you spend your time on? What are, what are the things that your thoughts go to? What do you worry about? What are, where does your money go? I could probably identify your idol pretty quickly. 
And you could probably identify your idol pretty quickly. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand or see what that may be. For this man, it was his money. For you, it may be something else. He, and going back to Luke chapter 14, finishing up here in, in verse 31, this the second analogy he uses, this idea of a king going to war. And he says, Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other one is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The second analogy of this king going to war, and he says, if a king goes to war, you're going to want to know troop counts. You're going to want to know strategy. You're going to want to know exactly what, what you're going to do to win this battle. It's something that he plans out, he thinks about beforehand, before just going into battle. Right? Or if not, then you're like, oh, well, we got to send a peace encounter here because they have a lot of troops and I don't want this to look bad on me. So you send the peace delegation out. No, he comes prepared. A good king comes prepared for war. He deliberates. And what Jesus is trying to say is before you say yes to being a follower of Christ, deliberate. Is this something that I feel called to do? Is this something I want to do? Is there anything else in my life that would be more important than this? If you go through that and look at your, your idols and say, is, if I had to get rid of all this or if I lost all of this, would I still follow Jesus? Would he still mean more to me than anything else in the world? And would, if, if everything else was gone, would it be Jesus and him alone? And, and that's all. And I would be satisfied and I would be fulfilled and I would be fine. And if you can't answer yes to that, then you are not ready to be a follower of Christ. You can come to church, you can play the game, but you are not ready to be a follower of Jesus. Until you say yes, that Jesus alone, and it's him alone, and nothing else matters, then the rest of it is just, is just playing a religious game, right? And you may be fooling everybody around you, but it doesn't fool God. He knows your heart. He knows what you deeply think about and what you're concerned about and what is on your mind all the time. I want to end with a, with a couple of these stories here, of, and it goes in, and it's Luke chapter 9. We're looking at verse 57. A couple other people come to Jesus again and ask to follow him, just like we saw here with the rich man. And Luke chapter 9, verse 57 says, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Right? Sounds good. He's got the right saying. He's got the church expression. I'll follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. I'm there. I'm with you. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. All right, foxes have holes, birds have nests to go to sleep in at night, but Jesus, Son of God, has nowhere to, to lay his head down. I haven't, he's homeless. And he said, You want to follow me wherever I go? You're going to follow me to homelessness right now. Second analogy, he says to another, he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. It's an expression that doesn't quite translate for us, but this expression literally meant that you carried on your father's business. Go, he said, I need to bury my father, meant when my father dies, I'm, I'm freed from that obligation to my father and my, my work, and then I can go follow you, Jesus. But I got to wait until he dies first before I can be freed of my obligation. He, this man here, had felt like he had owed his dad this thing first before he could actually follow Jesus. Family again. And then the third one, he says, Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This man had another excuse, and this one I think probably is one of the best out of all three. This man is saying, I'm just going to say bye to people first. Let me go and say my farewells and my goodbyes and get my house in order. Probably won't be too long, Jesus. And he says, if you want to follow me, follow me. If you want to follow Jesus, follow Jesus. You know, I realize that as we talk about this idea of following Christ, some of you guys have made a decision to follow Christ, and you're just being reminded you're, you're a follower of Jesus, and you've made a commitment to follow Christ, and you're just being reminded of what it may mean to follow Jesus. And that counting the cost and, and realizing that there is a cost to following Christ and that sometimes it may not look well on you to the outside world. You may look stupid and crazy. 
Um, if you tell somebody, yes, I mean, we, we've preached a book through the book of Jonah and preaching about a, a fish that swallows a man and spits him out on dry land three days later, and we believe that to be a miracle. It's not something that normally happens, but yes, we believe it to be true. When you believe the Bible to be true, people are going to think you're crazy. They will. They'll think you're crazy. Because a lot of the things that we talk about and we believe, they do. They sound crazy. But we absolutely believe them to be true. People will think that. There will be times when you go to live for Christ and follow Christ and, and want to make the decisions that, that are best to, to follow Christ and your family and to lead your family in that way. And there will be those in your own family who will say opposite to that. They will come against you. Maybe they're friends or close friends or guys that you, you love dearly. And, and they just have terrible advice for you. And you may have to go against what they say in order to follow Jesus. You may be asked to do things. I mean, you think of it just in a simple, in a work environment or something, that are unethical, against your code of values or whatever, and, and you have to stand up against those things because they're not ethical, they're not right. Following Jesus is more important. Maybe you're single and you're wanting to be married one day and you're hoping to find a spouse and, and instead of saying like, well, you know what, I'm, this person is good enough, does this, instead of asking, does this person love Jesus, I'm going to go ahead with good enough. Jesus makes the decision. He's a decision factor there. In your marriage, you're thinking, you know what, I don't know if I love this person anymore. I think we're done. I think we're toast. I think we're ready for this thing to be over because I'm not happy. Jesus is the decision factor. It's not about being happy. It's about realizing that marriage is a covenant with God, that it expresses the actually picture of Jesus in the gospel, that you're to love each other the way that God has loved us. Everything changes when Jesus gets into the picture. My whole world is reoriented. Your whole world is reoriented. The way you see your family, the way you see your work environment, the way you see other people, it changes. And nothing is the same anymore. And so you may be a follower of Christ and maybe just kind of reorienting to realize, am I following Jesus? Is he enough? Is he alone enough for me? Or do I feel like I need something else? Or maybe you're not a follower of Jesus Christ and you realize that, you understand that. And for you, you're just trying to think through is maybe you just need to count the cost. Before you say, yes, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, and you, 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 we started the parade and, and the cheering and everything else, we say, count the cost. Have you counted the cost of what it means to follow Jesus? Are you ready to follow him? He's paid for your, 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 your life 100%. Are you ready to follow Jesus? I'll be in the back, um, right on that left side over there, and uh, if, if you want to talk or have questions or um, just want somebody to pray with you. I would love to pray with you. I would love to talk with you. Um, things that are going on in your life or questions you have specifically um, about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus um, and, or just to, do you have questions or concerns or, or again, you can send me a, a, an email, bobby at redemptionutah.com. Um, and then I also have cards in the back. It's got my phone number on it. Feel free to call me, text me or whatever. Um, but that's what we're, we're here to do. And it's all about following Jesus, and that is the most important thing. Let's pray.